false economy of the West. The, the reality is, I know uh, myself, when I lived in Worcester, Worcester jobs don't pay very well, so I used to commute to Birmingham. Um, then I started getting my contracts from London because what I found was that Worcester wages were terrible, Birmingham wages could pay up to twice as much, and then London wages could pay four times as much as the Worcester wage. Uh, and it's all done in the same areas. You know, it's a false economy um, in many ways because you're doing the same job, but just signed off, you know, like the agencies in London, it's not a Birmingham agency, it's not a Worcester agency, so the wages were higher, bizarrely. Um, but this also ties in with cost of living, because I couldn't afford to live in London, but the rates were higher because they accommodated for the London rates. And the same with Birmingham, Birmingham's, well, Birmingham's actually a bit cheaper than Worcester, um, but the thing with certain skills is there's a market for it in Birmingham where Worcester doesn't have a market for anything unless you're like um, being basic um, manual labor which most of that's actually gone now because with the influx of the poles etc they've took all that work it used to be quite easy to get hold of but what my point being is if I take my own personal uh, salary etc I used to earn around a thousand pounds a week so it's about four thousand a month my tax in other bits and pieces would remove twelve hundred pounds of that straight away that's before I've even seen it um, now if my cost of living in the UK is fifteen hundred pounds so if I'd actually had that cost of living as well, because uh, that was my minimum cost of living, um, you could tie that in. Uh, so that's what one, one seven, two, two thousand seven hundred. So I've got thirteen hundred pounds a month left after that, um, which seems a quite a quite a large chunk of change. Uh, but when you start factoring in that there is other costs living in the UK, you know, the going out, for example, because obviously this doesn't factor in going out for a drink or that at the weekends where you're paying three, four pounds a drink or even more. Uh, where in Spain I'm paying what, 99 cents for a bottle of wine. And it's a nice bottle of wine. It's not uh, battery acid or something. Um, so you start factoring that in, you're down to, say, six, seven hundred quid a month that it's actually spare capital. So to get that standard of living, I'm working long hours because it's not 40, um, a 40 hour week or 37 and a half, it's around 55 to 60 hours a week. Um, I'm away from home regularly and for what? For 700 pounds spare a month because this is how you should be factoring in your cost of living. Um, because what I really want is that end figure of £700 a month after I've paid all my bills and maybe had a going out with some friends, etc. If I can actually stay, save £700 a month, then I'm quids in. Agreed? So here I am in Spain, as you can see, walking in the park, middle of the day, just dropped the kids off at school. And the first thing I want to say is if we don't want to go out for meals and stuff in Spain, um, and we just part it around. Our cost of living is currently a thousand euros a month. Um, now, bear in mind, I do a few bits and pieces at home. Even if I didn't do these YouTube videos, I would still be bringing an income of around 750, 800 euros a month from stuff I've done over the years on the internet. So, without actually working, I'm only 200 euros short of my sustainable budget. Now, if I got all my apartments rented out in the Philippines, I'm way over. Um, currently, they're empty. We've got people coming November and December. But it'd be nice to get some full-time people in there because I want to develop it a bit more. Um, because at the moment, we're getting a lot of 
people that are coming to meet their husbands or yeah, meet their wives, etc. And also people that are coming back from the Middle East, etc. Uh, OFWs. But I've had some permanent residents, it would be nice. Because it just means I've got some sustainable income to construct the rest of the bits and pieces I want to do there. But what, what's my point in all this? Well, the fact is, in the UK, you get caught up so much in earning money, you forget the fact you're not actually living. Like I just said, I'm nearly heating budget without actually working. But I've still got 40, 60 hours a week that I can work. I've still got the ability um, that, okay, in the UK I had a company car, but in Spain I don't even need a car. So even if I wanted to come, you know, add a car in, it's cheaper in Spain than the UK. So everything sort of becomes more relative because the reason I'm bringing this up is a lot of people get hung up on I'm earning this don't look at what you're earning look at what you're spending look at the hidden expenses I mean you take a car in the UK you get your car right you tax when you buy it you tax when you uh, service it you tax when you MOT it you tax when you fuel it you tax to use it on the roads you tax to insure it so how much tax are you paying just for having a mode of transport that is generally used to get you to work? Because even on that, it's, it's a lot of money. And a lot of time, you don't even need it. I mean, I know people that actually do not even have a driving license. Um, and I know myself, I don't like using public transport, but I don't mind cycling or walking. It's just that the work I generally do is hundreds of miles away from where, where I'm normally living but there's always ways to actually get on target and I think this is more relevant today because I think in generations to come it's people like myself that will still be employed and there's a reason for it um, in the US they're starting to replace American workers with Indians and Pakistani staff because they're using a um, visa that was actually put in place for uh, overseas workers where American skills were short but now corporations are using it to monetize on replacing it, their American staff with cheap immigrants um, yes the quality will go downhill I don't care what anybody says I mean uh, I see it from the IT guys in the UK heavily frustrated that there used to be like say 12 UK guys they've been doing it for the last 10 20 years replaced with 15 Indian people that graduated earlier on this year and are just picking it up as they go because the companies actually suffer and the whole yes yes we can do it mentality that you constantly hear um, it's very common in the Asian culture it's like yeah we can do it and the fact is they can't is very common um, but guess what guess which which people companies look for people like myself that are still within reason cost wise and at the same time we're actually time served educated experienced etc because they know they can't rely on these other people um, this is why the I mean the FM industry is going through some major problems at the moment nobody talks about it and I'm sure if I went, delved into it too much I'll probably have a few legal problems um, not that I would be wrong, it's just they'd want to actually gag me for telling the truth. Um, but they've lost the knowledge, they've lost the experience, they've lost time served people. Because a lot of them will just go, I'll take redundancy rather than deal with you idiots. Because it's gone from engineers and experienced people to I'm a manager and I'm an accountant. An accountant only looks at price. A manager only manages. They have no idea what they're doing a lot of the time. They just manage people. They don't know what the equipment is, how to service it, how to maintain it, what the real cost of it is, because they don't come from that industry. In fact, they wouldn't even know half the stuff because some of it was installed before they were born. Bit of a rant there. But the, the whole point of this is there's going to be more and more work for people that can keep their costs in line. And I'll be honest with you, the more I earn now, and keep my costs down, the more I bank. The more I bank and the more I invest, 
the less I need to work. So it then becomes more and more to my advantage not to actually work because I don't need to. Um, but I just wanted to say this because I know a lot of people will go, I earn this much. No, you don't. First thing you want to do, take your tax off the, off the top. So the first thing I do is go, right, I'm paying this in tax. Oh, balls to that. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to come under the tax threshold. Because once you go, right, I've hit the tax threshold, I'm stopping work, I'm going to sit in my backside for a few months, you'll get a tax rebate on the excess you paid because you've brought yourself back under the tax threshold. It may sound a bit severe, but why should I be paying 40% tax? Don't see why I should. I'll be honest with you, I don't see why I should. So, you know, at the end of the day, anybody who works should be paying the same rates. Um... I know there's a lot of financial fiddling done, but here, here's a bit of truth for you. doesn't matter if you're a Conservative or Labour supporter in the UK, or Liberal or Democratic in the US, the people that get penalised are the ones in the middle. They all talk those at the bottom um, and tax the 1% at the top or whatever. Reality is the ones that suffer are always the ones in the middle because we pay for all of it. Um, I don't care what anybody says, that's the reality of it. Anything that changes on the top or the bottom is the middle guys that pay for it. That's where all the cash comes from, is the people actually, the, the doers. Um, the hangers-on or those that can't work or refuse to work um, aren't putting into the, system, into the system in the first place. And the ones at the top are rich enough to know how to avoid paying tax in the first place. So they don't suffer. It's the guys in the middle, whatever changes. Uh, thanks for watching.